the National Technical Director for Molten Salt Reactors, Dr. Lou Qualls, or as he refers to himself, Sweet Lou. What I want to do is explain my perspective a little bit on advanced reactor development, molten salt reactor development. It takes a long time for a new technology to reach maturity and saturation within a market. That can be as long as 50 years or more. If you want something to be in the system and functioning in the system, you have to start early and it takes some time. The nuclear takes 50 years to ramp up to maturity. It's going to be you know, something to consider as we move forward. But the other thing to notice is you can change things quickly if you really want to. If you look at the coal, you can see it turned down pretty rapidly. A decision that was made, we were going to use less coal. So we did change that very quickly. But give something up, you've got to use something else. And in this case, the thing that responds the quickest is natural gas. So you did make the situation better here, but you, you had to trade coal for natural gas in order to meet the demand. So that's one thing to notice. You can make changes quickly if you have the will to do so. But typically, technologies take a while to mature into the market. At the renewable end of the spectrum, they too have ramped up quickly and are increasing in market share. And that is very positive news. Energy is like preaching. Every little bit helps. We expect to see growth in those areas as well. But the reality is, if you add up coal, natural gas, and petroleum, that there is a lot of energy to be made up. And the only way to do that in a clean manner, significantly, is nuclear power. So from my perspective, the molten salt reactor development is a near-term need for the nation. So I tend to think of things in a very applied approach. What can we be doing today? How soon can we get our first reactors running? How quickly can we learn from those? And how quickly can we deploy new reactor technologies for the market? You know, you hear the timeframes of interest. You hear the awards being proposed for builds within the next five to seven years. Aggressive near-term focus is very, very important. That's the way we're approaching molten salt reactor development, as I know this community is as well. Molten salt reactors, I think, are so powerful and flexible of machines, they can meet almost all of our U.S. energy objectives. But it is a little different. And when it is a little different, it takes a little longer to familiarize folks with what it is and why it's important. We've made a lot of progress in the last few years on that. And 500 people register for this workshop is an indication that the community understands that and is interested and excited about that. When you're ready to go and make some electricity, what's that going to look like? You know, the issue is, is that the existing licensing framework doesn't align well with the inherent features of MSRs. And there's a lot happening in the advanced reactor licensing arena that we need to think about and consider along the way. Licensing modernization project is completed. TCAP effort is underway. There's new guidance on the use of functional containments. MSRs are said to have readily understandable safety case. This is a phrase that I hear from David quite a bit. And uh, I think it, it makes a lot of sense, but I'm kind of in the prove it to me category. So what does that really mean? Can MSRs be designed in such a way that their safety response is easy to follow? And what are the types of safety critical components likely needed for MSRs? The real question is how few of them do you need? Can you get that number down as low as possible? And how will MSRs systems work together to satisfy safety functions? The purpose of this effort was to discuss these features of MSRs that we as a community think provide a lot of advantage as a reactor type. How does that translate into an actual application? Gather an understanding and bring the community to sort of a common place. We're early in the process for liquid-fueled molten salt reactor development. People are developing their designs and they are developing approaches to licensing. We're looking for basic understanding that allows us to get progress made early in this process and start the conversation so that developers and utilities and regulators can be having a common conversation moving forward at the right pace, but also to identify the gaps that we're going to have to close in order to be successful, both in data and uh, modeling and analysis capabilities that we're going to need. Right now, we're looking at it at a very generic high level because all these designs will be slightly different and we want an approach that will work for everyone and allow everyone to be successful. It is really up to the developers to decide on their safety assessment approaches within their overall licensing strategy. 
the DOE is not endorsing a particular approach. We're not recommending a particular approach. That will come from the developers. We're happy to help once you've decided which way you want to go. Anything we can do to help, we're there to help. But we really look to the community to set the lead on what they want to do. One thing about MSR is it's important to tell people every time you talk about it is they're different. And they're so different that they really allow for the possibility of fundamental change. They can be designed with inherent safety. They're low pressure systems. They have limited excess reactivity. Salts provide a first but limited barrier to fission product release. But some products will come out during normal operation and can be removed and sequestered and controlled. And you also have the ability to monitor and manipulate fuel. These are the reasons why we like these reactor systems. We think that they can lead to simplified reactor concepts. And that is in quotes because there's nothing simple about a power reactor. They're all complex to some degree, but MSRs have the possibility for robust design margins. You can perhaps get rid of most or many of the traditional fast acting reactor safety systems that you have in others. And you will have an increased reliance on passive safety in probably any advanced reactors, molten salt reactors included. So those are good features. That's why we like them, but it does create some challenges. So we have a distributed radionuclide inventory that must be accounted for and accommodated, which is unique for other types of reactors and and what people are used to looking at. Basically, we went through and defined containment barriers within a typical MSR. Salt is the first but limited barrier to fission product release. Then there are innermost containments, which is the boundary containing those inventories. So it's the primary boundary system or the structure of the off-gas system. So things that normally contain significant quantities of radionuclides is an innermost containment. And those are typically surrounded in what we call the reactor containment. It's an engineering envelope around the innermost containments. Sometimes it's a reactor silo, for example, and it is a controlled atmosphere and it's usually mostly leak type system designed to isolate as a second barrier. And then there's what's called facility containment, which is the building that surrounds the reactor containment and contacts the environment. This is a box within a box within a box, and how they interplay with each other is one of the parts of what we worked on. So we considered the implications of assumed severe accidents on barrier performance. And by that, we said, assume the innermost containment layer fails. Just it it gets breached in some way, be it the vessel, be it a pipe, be it a pump bowl, and that you get spillage or leakage of either a gas and a cover gas system or off gas system or the salt in the liquid level of a primary system. We don't have design specifics to work towards. So we just assume generic configurations that we think are likely candidates for molten salt reactors. And we just assume an innermost failure and in addition to another simultaneous independent failure, which would be different for each reactor concept, depending on what they have in their functional containment layers. And then look at the potential failure points and release barriers to understand how these layers are going to interact with one another. So this was really developed for uh, liquid-fueled MSRs. It has some relevance, particularly with respect to mass accountancy of some radionuclides and their transport within the system to FHRs. But being a solid-fueled system, FHR licensing will probably look a little different. But we did look at chloride and fluoride salts and evaluated them for the most significant radionuclides and assessed their chemical states and their radiotoxicity. So trying to figure out which five or six or 10 things you're going to track instead of tracking everything because they matter. They generally matter if they influence reactor behavior or contribute to personnel dose or equipment dose, or if they contribute to dose consequence in an accident scenario. And then we looked at likely system configurations and passive heat removal systems. So off-gas systems, containment structures, and off-gas passive heat removal systems, prax, drax, RVAX, storage tanks, and systems like that. What did we learn from the exercise? Well, we knew this before we went into it. MSRs are sufficiently different from other reactors to warrant specific evaluation. It's going to be very important to bring the stakeholder community along in this conversation together. You don't want to surprise somebody with a design and a licensing approach that they're going to be sort of caught off guard with. You need to make sure that the approach that you're taking is something that is going to be acceptable.
there is the possibility that MSRs can be simpler systems, but how simple is it really is something to be determined. The actual operation of a plant, the day-to-day maintenance of a plant, finding things, fixing things, repairing things are all going to be complex operations. While they can be simpler, perhaps, than existing reactors, they're still going to be complex and there's going to be a lot of work to be done. MSR share characteristics with fuel processing facilities that can provide a broader experience base for safety evaluation. You have multiple locations where you can have significant inventories of radionuclide. They can move around the plant. They do as part of normal operation. You might use used fuels in your system, so they have to be transported in and stored. So there's a lot of considerations from that operational base that could potentially help us. But it's still a reactor, so you're going to have to look at it from both perspectives. Mass accountancy is probably the highest priority development need that we have at the moment. We need to know where our inventories are with sufficient accuracy to be safe and to understand what sort of heat removal requirements we're going to have and what the potential accident scenarios are to those consequence. The function of outer containment is a complex trade that influences overall plant economics. Are you going to put your reactor below grade or above grade? Are you going to have an overall leak tightness of your containment layers or not? These things are up to the developers to design and develop and decide what their system looks like. And we want to be prepared to help them whichever way they decide to go. So the fuel reprocessing plant attributes in common with MSRs are basically the fact that they're low pressure systems with inventories in multiple places, routine movement of gas, liquids, and solids, but they lack high pressure power conversion systems. So the reactor is going to have one of those And we're going to have to contend with that as a potential energy source within the system. So again, MSRs could benefit from both a reactor and processing plant safety assessment perspective. So it could be instructive to go through the exercise looking at it from two different ways. There are a lot of gaps right now in our ability to do an effective quantitative MSR safety assessment. And we need to be working on those. One is a lack of design detail. Developers are coming along, and when they start getting their designs finalized and start sharing them, we can help more with those. There is a limited amount of failure mode identified and along with their frequency analysis of those failures. So we have a limited amount of operational data with MSR systems and technology. And until we get more data, it's going to be hard to determine how frequent things happen But it's still not impossible to start by guessing what might happen at this point and start that way. The techniques to analyze salt-based passive decay heat removal systems is limited. We've not had large experimental systems to verify this behavior. We have thermophysical property uncertainties that are going to play into the response of those systems that we don't know yet. We can look at it in modeling, but until we actually do it, then... uh, Uh, We don't know. And we don't know the potential degradation modes. There's a lot of gaps related to mass transport during normal operation and bulk salt behavior during spill events, such as spilling, is very limited. So we definitely need to get to the point where we understand those systems better. Important point is that bounding accident evaluation can certainly be instructive, but it can oversimplify important system interactions that can potentially lead to mis-events. Even though we might consider doing a bounding accident scenario, at some point you're going to have to do a systematic and rigorous evaluation of your plant. A PRA of some sort is going to be required to license a commercial reactor. And then what we kind of discovered along the way was that the early phases of the LMP process are very similar to what we discussed in the report as an early phase bounding accident assessment with preliminary PHA. The other thing is, it's going to be important to take the team along with you as you go, have a consistent conversation, routinely touch up on topics with the community so people can follow along. MSRs can have very positive safety features. It's prudent to maintain those, keep it a low pressure system and eliminate energizing pathways. Those good practices are what we're going to need to help us develop ARDC specific to MSRs. There's a lot of things we don't know enough about, and we need to be working on them. Thermophysical, thermochemical properties of salts over the extended temperature range is one of them. So this is during accident scenarios when things start to freeze and when they overheat again. 
And the life cycles of important radionuclides within a plant are not well known. We need to be studying that. Bulk behavior of salt in off normal circumstances needs to be determined experimentally, and those need to be put into our models. And the range of responses possible from passive safety systems needs to be explored rigorously. So you, you said that the PRA is going to be required. Uh, what are the principles behind this PRA? I think that's up to developers to decide exactly what approach they want to take and how much quantitative data that they're going to have to have and what level of PRA they're able to execute. And that would be balanced by desire for PRA information to be used in the licensing dis discussion, the expectation that it will be. And there'll be some balance for these first plants, perhaps, because we won't know everything we'd like to know. And we have to design additional conservatisms into the system to overcome those uncertainties. And that's just a balance that'll have to be developed along the way. Will there be any considerations for gain vouchers to support universities doing work for companies? I think that's for me. At this point in time, there are a number of avenues for funding work with universities and the gain vouchers are not open to that. If you need some help identifying what those opportunities are, please call the gain team so we can help you get connected to the right places. We do watch across the entire DOE complex, different funding opportunities, uh, the types of technologies that they're looking for. Whether it's a gain voucher or not, we can help you get connected to the right place. At the Office of Nuclear Energy, up to 20% of our funding for research and development programs goes toward university awards, and industry can certainly partner with universities in those projects. So please look for those opportunities as well. And that funding opportunity is posted at the GAME website. What are plans to actually build MSRs in prototype size, not just loops and running codes at the labs? Or are there only commercial efforts out there? Well, I'll say this, we only learn by doing. And um, so I would say, let's get on to building things that look like reactors and our reactors as soon as possible. But that's driven by the community. We have to have good strategies, support from industry. DOE will be supportive as well. But those timelines are up to developers, I think. Our job is to help facilitate their success and make it possible as soon as we can do that. In terms of workforce development of nuclear engineers trained on MSR slash FHR technology, is the workforce growing at the rate needed by industry? I think industry is going to have to tell us whether they think there are an adequate number of people. Every major nuclear department has MSR activities going on. We get contacted all the time about people wanting to participate in MSR research. It is widespread and it is gaining momentum and we need to find ways to get sustained funding to that as well. But certainly the enthusiasm is there for it and the, and the students are there for it and the young scientists at the labs are interested in it. GAIN and DOE are actively looking at how we make sure that we build out the pipeline. 